I think uh, Amanda will be feeding back some questions from um, from the group and also from the from the YouTube comments, so that we can kind of have a brief discussion about each of the presentations and see what comes up. So I'll let you take a floor on that. Okay, thank you, uh, Kevin. Um, so I do have a few questions. Thank you so much for those uh, wonderful interventions so far and uh, any questions that are coming up um, within our small group. Um, in addition to, to what's come off of uh, YouTube, please uh, do um, uh, come in uh, when the time is appropriate. Uh, we have a lot of time. So the first question is for Chantal from Andy uh, Higginbottom, who's a member of AGE, uh, one of our group. Um, he says, thank you for a great review. You mentioned Walter's uh, connection with dependency theory. Could you expand on this? Is there a connection with Latin American currents? Thank you, Andy, for your question. Unfortunately, I must say I'm not well versed on the dependency theory, but yes, there is a connection with Latin America. Um, and just if I can sort of elaborate, just the idea that through capitalism, including slavery and colonization, um, African societies, but only, not only limited to African societies, many societies around the world, Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean, have become economically dependent on Europe in terms of resources and aid, etc. So short answer, yes, there is a connection to um, Latin America. Thank you. Uh, we've got another one uh, for you from another uh, panelist, uh, Wazir Mohammed. He asks, does decolonization mean having black faces or is there a much deeper uh, meaning? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. So I think that at the core of the struggle, especially as expressed by students, um, there is a desire to not only see um, non-white professors, but also to change the curriculum. And I think this is where it's quite impactful um, in terms of, you know, not only who is on the reading list, but highlighting those marginalized voices as historians, um, as academics such as Sadia Hartman and Christina Sharp have looked to the colonial archive and said, well, you know, this is full of violence, obviously. And how, and how do we make sure, how do we ensure not to repeat that violence um, when we're writing about, you know, writing histories of slavery, for example, who, what voices are we bringing forth? Um, what silences can be acknowledged? So I think it's impactful in terms of the curriculum and people are making, academics are making changes as driven by students. But I agree that there is this, it's a marketing tool for many institutions. And so I'd, I think decolonizing the university is not possible, but I think there can be ways in which we can, as much as possible, sort of shift um, some of our perspectives to the curriculum and how we teach, even though I think to decolonize the curriculum is, is um, mostly impossible to, because it's very stagnant, very limited. Let me just come in here and say why I asked the question, because, um, you know, we, we live in a world in which we call it a multicultural world, whatever you want to call it. But we see these divisions and these binaries continuing and, and it's being deepened. So somebody like myself, for instance, I'm not white enough, nor am I black enough sometimes. I may be, as con I may be conscious, but I'm not white enough, nor am I black enough. So it, your equality gets circumscribed based on your skin color rather than your consciousness and your levels of consciousness. And it's a, it's a problematic that that we face in, in real time, in the everyday. Um, and, and it's, um, you know, somebody who may be black, but may be, um, may be a, 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 an imperialist, have a, have a seat at the table, 
when somebody is white or close to whiteness or close to blackness, cannot get that seat at the table, although they are more conscious. And, and although that they're minor or decolonized. And that's, I, I want you to think about that. I, I wasn't looking for an argument. Mm, thank you. Well, Valerie Amos, you know, um, I think it's a key example of that. It was, you know, I, I was interested in seeing how the leadership would develop at SOAS, but, you know, as you made reference to supporting the Iraq war and having that frame of mind is, didn't shift the needle, didn't change anything substantial for me and for many students of colour um, at SOAS. So thank you. There's such a rich, rich discussion there as well. The other aspect I was thinking of was when you were speaking is the, the class element. Um, going back to Chinedu's, um point, as soon as, you know, Walter Rodney at one level was a working class scholar academic at one point in time. Um, and the issue about whether decolonizing can also happen on, on a class basis. Um, uh, these intersections, uh, which I know is a dirty word, um, but um, nonetheless, it's, it, it gets really complicated. He did some amazing things trying though, didn't he? Um, which um, in Jamaica in particular. Um, okay, we can keep this conversation going. We've got a lot of time, but for the time being, I'm gonna uh, direct a question to Chinedu from Kate's elec uh, Eclectic, excuse me. Um, what are the major differences between Rodney and Fanon, um, and here she uh, indicates that they're not a, a historian. Um, so, but if you could just give us a, a an overview of, of your view on that, please. Well, I, I think in my talk, um, I did highlight um, a, a lot of the similarities between Rodney and Fanon, especially in terms of their, their pessimism towards the um towards the the petty bourgeoisie and how it can become uh, a treacherous class but i think that they did have fundamental differences especially uh, in terms of how how they considered the well um, um, the role of the of the workers and i think uh, fanon you know with with all the respect you fanon fanon is is the quintessential uh, third worldist and i encourage everybody to read his book uh, wretched of the earth which is an amazing uh, manifesto of anti um, of anti colonialism. Um, Fanon had a different view on the working class, where he didn't see them as a as a revolutionary class. He saw them more as a kind of a, a labor aristocracy that actually um, benefited from the crumbs of imperialism. And, and for Fanon, um, the major actor of of the anti colonial movement was. Um, was rather the peasantry, which was a spontaneous uh, revolutionary force that needed to be channeled by, uh, by if you want, a group of revolutionary uh, intellectuals. And also, he had a lot of hope in in the Lupin, um, in the Lupin proletariat, those who live in the towns and the cities and don't have jobs and 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 who kind of like live in slums. And so that was the revolutionary classes that Fanon kind of like identified. Um, for Rodney. What's interesting uh, in his work, and I think this ties in very much with his work in, in Guyana, is that he places a lot of hope um, uh, in the working class. And this is why he looks at the working class struggles in, in Tanzania. And, and more importantly, when he's organizing within the Working People's Alliance uh, uh, in, in Guyana, he, um, he, 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 you know, he supports the strike of, uh, of sugar workers and, and bauxite miners against the dictatorship of Ford uh, Burnham in Guyana. I'll let the other speakers uh, talk about that. But one of the interesting things that Rodney says in one of his speeches is that, you know, the work working classes um, ability to, to hold labor, to use, um, to use the weapon of the strike is its most powerful tool to actually bring down the dictatorship. And what the working class needs to do uh, in this struggle is to build you know, alliances with other oppressed groups in society and lead them towards liberation. Thank you. Okay, I've got another question from you. Uh, this one from Andy uh, Higginbottom again. We're not Peasants in Tanzania also working people. You seem to identify working class with waged workers. Uh, 
Sorry, excuse me. That's for you as well. Do you want me to repeat it? Oh, yes, please. That would be great. Sure. Sorry. Okay. Um, so were not the peasants in Tanzania also working people? You seem to identify the working class with wage workers. Yeah, I think that's a very good question. And I think, honestly, the, the, the peasantry is a very complicated class uh, to grapple with. I think when we look at the, um, the African continent, most 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 peasants i think belong to belong to if you want the um the lower echelons of the petty bourgeoisie uh and what i mean by that is that th this is a distinction that is made in marxism um when i talked about the intellectual intelligentsia we're talking about the upper echelon of the petty bourgeoisie um what marx traditionally means by the petty bourgeoisie are groups of people who actually con who actually um if you want, employ their own labor, um, who own their little plots of land and stuff like that. And in some instances, they can be very poor and even more and even more oppressed than the workers. And this, I think, is the case for um, a large section of the peasants uh, in Africa. However, you have different agricultural formations in Africa, like, for instance, agricultural uh, wage laborers, you know, who, who work sometimes in Tanzania in the large like sisal and, and coffee plantations. And, and, and these are a section of the peasantry who are also like exploited and who are perhaps, you know, uh, much closer um, to the working class in that extent. So I think when we're talking about the peasantry, it's quite complicated and quite diverse. And I hope that would, <laughs> that's a kind of a useful summary. I think, Chinedo, you're correct because the peasantry in Africa, the peasantry in the Caribbean and in Guyana, Walter Rodney was very clear. He distinguished them from this idea of the peasantry in feudal Europe. Um, and so the, the term peasantry is borrowed um, in the historiography. So it, it's a kind of misnomer. And Walter, in history of the Guyanese working people, if you analyze it, analyze his work, and it, he died early um, after, after doing that work. I'm certain that he would have clarified this some more. So yes, he connected these outgrowths, which were peasant outgrowths, with the working people in the mm -hmm. Caribbean because they could not, they were not peasants in the European, in the classical sense. Mm -hmm. um, they, he, so he classified them as, as being part of the working people. Could I come in here for a moment? Um, I think Walter went a step further, um, was here and said in um, uh, a work, a, an address, the birth of the Guyanese King Class and the first sugar strikes of 1844 to 1 and 1847, uh, that he was questioning the idea that the term peasantry is accurate for describing those people. He, he talked about them as being rural wage workers or part-time wage workers. And I think this is one of the significant features that um, Walter added to the historiography of uh, and the Caribbean. And it's important as an example of us questioning terminology that we receive from um, previous generations, some of which are really um, colonialist terminologies. And this gives me the opportunity to question terminology that I heard here. You know, um, my ancestors were not slaves. They were enslaved Africans. And we could have a long um, discussion on this. But, um, epistemology is extremely important. And I think that one of, the way forward, one of the ways forward for us is recognizing that a lot of the terminology we ac have accepted comes out of a Eurocentric and a an oppressive epistemology, and that part of our liberation is really apprehending more clearly the phenomena that we live in. But I'm threatening to run away with this, so let's stop there. Um, yeah, can I come back to yeah, Nehusi's point, which um, actually it is a really good one. But I think that um, Ronnie is clear is that when we're talking about about classes and especially about the question of class uh, class formation it's not simply just a question of terminology it is i think it's also a question of of, of method 
And, and what we have to do is look at, you know, um, the relationships of how groups of people are related to one another through their connections to, to the different means of production and see how classes emerge from, from that process. And this analysis has to be done uh, thoroughly in every um, kind of situation and every kind of context that we involve ourselves in. And this is like something that he says um, a lot, you know, against, um, against some of the more like um, European Marxists who simply just transpose notions of class of Europe um, into into Africa and say no, that's that's too that's too simplistic. You can't go to Africa in the 1970s and, and simply say that the um, uh, that the um, I don't know that Nier is part of the same bourgeoisie as any other kind of class. And no, the class analysis is more is more complicated. And I think that's what he shows very well through his writings and speeches. Thank you. I wasn't seeking to, to I wasn't seeking to reduce the exercise to mere um, terminology is the starting point for um, defining clearly or more exactly what we're dealing with. Um, I'm going to say some more about this because um, it implicates, if I might use that word, um, Chinedo's point about um, class. And I would talk about the whole definition of class, uh, especially working class later on. So I'm signaling um, my intention in doing this. But, but Schneider makes a very important intervention, which is that, you know, where Walter's methodology was taking us is that we cannot generalize and on, 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 on create, create definitions that are general because the, the, the real processes of exploitation, which is what we're talking about, and, and transition of wealth from one group to another, happens in the local communities and it is happening more and more now this is why we cannot generalize even on race on ethnicity on class because it comes out of the real workings of the market as it operates in each local community and i think that is where the methodology of walter rodney comes into play that's where the relevance is in relationship to his scholarship especially um, with regards to how you were upon the developed Africa. Thank you. I, I would also add um, his, it, it wasn't even historical work, it was grounded sociological analysis of whatever culture he was looking at, put that social formation, and this is what he does have in common, not just with dependency theorists, but specifically Marxist dependency theorists, like Marini, uh, from Brazil um, in the context of a system of capitalism and imperialism. And imperialism was a class system for him. So it wasn't just that your, um, uh, the, the bourgeoisie of, of your, or the landowners, uh, or whatever it happened to be, and whatever social formation it was looking at, were the primary, you know, the point of antagonism, but also the global chains that they were feeding into, the multinationals like Exxon and Guyana right now, that are also part of that class analysis. And he was, it was a very Marxist analysis from my perspective, but coming from yes. a perspective, again, of revolutionary Pan-Africanism and Marxism from the global South, which does not simply posit, you know, this, this generic, you know, industrial working class as a revolutionary class. I do have a couple of questions or comments for Hamza, and then hopefully we can pick this up again. We've got another half hour of discussion in the second half. Um, so I, we've got a couple of comments, one from Anthony O'Hara from uh, towards Hamza. Thank you, ha um, Hamza, for this exposition from the inside out. Um, Kate, uh, Kate's eclectic, uh, says, as an educator, this resonates. Thank you. The entire world is following a Victorian British curriculum. And actually, uh, was there also made a, a comment saying that uh, the leaders are still copying and pasting. Check the agricultural policy of the African Union versus that of the EU. And I would add the EU trade agreements with respect to Africa and the ACP in general. Um, there's one last question, um, and this is in general. Uh, again, from Kate's Eclectic, a general question to anyone who can answer Rodney's positioning of women in his works, because white women are sidelined in capitalist patriarchy, but black women 
don't exist, uh, you know, think about Audre Lorde and so on. Anyone can pick that one up. Okay, I, I will pick it up then, actually. Um, I'm just looking around for a, a book. I, it, he does um, talk about uh, gender and women in a very grounded way, particularly coming out of the WPA experience, Working People's Alliance in uh, Guyana, uh, where he was organizing, obviously, with his amazing wife, uh, Dr. Patricia Rodney, but also uh, organizers like um, Andaya, who has uh, who passed, we lost her uh, two years ago, but who has uh, an amazing book out. Uh, finally, we have a book of her writing called The Point is to Change the World. Um, he, it's not, I don't think, um, this is where the historical side of him or, or his historical uh, credentials or, or praxis, uh, not praxis, um, style of writing comes to the foreground. I think um, rather than talking about gender in a specific way, he notes uh, the way um, women in, for example, the African village uh, movement in Guyana following emancipation um, uh, were part of the, the, the workforce, uh, how they were um, uh, oppressed in, in a particular way, how they were harassed in, in a particular way. But I think the major point is his um, uh, just organizing alongside women in, in formations like the WPA. I'll, I'll link to um, Andaya's uh, work in the chat and on, on the Facebook group. Are there any other interventions, yeah, the, the any other, other comments? Thing, the other thing, Amanda, is the way in which women embraced Walter Rodney and his ethos and the methodology and became equal partners in the struggle for change in Guyana, even after he was assassinated. So there was an instance during the bauxite strike in the early 1980s in Linden, where an East Indian brother was a trade unionist was arrested by the police. And it was the women in Linden who surrounded the police station and, and, and said, you can't do this. Um, and then there was another incident during the food marches on the West of Marari, where I'm from, where when the police came out with their guns, the inspiration of women that, that was brought into the struggle, um, women went to the forefront and based their bosoms against the gun butts and said, today you will have to kill us first. Thank you so much for that. Um, anyone else uh, want to come in? We've got, we have a minute uh, of Q&A time left. Okay, all right, thanks very much. Um, I am going to, uh, we're gonna go for break uh, for 10 minutes just to uh, rest our eyes, a screen break. Um, if you want to keep watching, uh, we're going to um, view a few minutes, the first 10 minutes of the 1979 film, The Time and the Terror, which was uh, produced by the Victor Hara uh, Collective. Um, it's a documentary examining uh, Guyanese struggles against British colonialism and violence in 1953, set against the poems of Martin Carter. And this, these first 10 minutes really um, foreground uh, Rodney's and, and the, the protagonism, the, the agency of the so-called shovel men, the working peoples of Guyana in the lead up to the struggle. We'll see you in 10 minutes. <laughs> 